Betting Franchise Secrets, Eric Von Horn. If you're not a part of the Franchise Secrets Facebook group, what are you waiting for? It's FranchiseSecrets.com slash Facebook. I cannot believe how valuable this group turned out to be. When someone asks a question, the feedback is honest, authentic, very helpful, and it's from multiple perspectives. If you're not sure that you're getting the most accurate information about franchising, then check out the largest, most helpful Facebook group in all of franchising. Whether you're a Z, a Zor, a buyer, or investor, join our free Facebook group at FranchiseSecrets.com slash Facebook. Hey, in this episode of Franchise Secrets, I took the best of the best from 2022, the most popular episodes, and I put together some clips of four different episodes and pieced them together. So one of them is on hiring and bringing or bringing on the right advisors. So it's all about advisories and how you grow faster with the right advisors, how you can shortcut mistakes with advisors. And my buddy Bennett is uh, the one that's really talking mostly about that. So that's a, a, a great episode. Also franchise funding with my friends, uh, Eric and Shirley, both with Bennett Trends and Fran Fund. And this is both for franchisees and franchisors. It's all about having the right mindset around funding. A lot of people uh, think of funding one way when really Zor should be thinking about it a couple different ways. And franchisees really need to have a good understanding, prospective franchisees need to have a good understanding of what funding really is, how it happens, when it happens, different options, advantages, and disadvantages. And then I did an episode on how to buy a franchise or franchise development. And again, both for Z's and Zor's. And this is really the buying process uh, that prospective franchisees go through. And I kind of do, I want to talk a little bit about how a franchisee sees it and a Zor sees it. And it really helps both prospective Z's and current Zor's understand that franchise development process, what, the be, what they should be aware of, what you should be looking out for, really what it's like, the, the, the real FranDev process. And then last, the fourth kind of piece of it is I was on with Jeff and Lane, and we were talking all about mistakes that new franchisors make because they make a ton of them because they don't have the right advisors, paid advisors, meaning the right attorneys, the right, the right people on payroll, or maybe advisors that they're get that are given advisory shares that have been through this whole process. So it's shortcut those mistakes. So we talk about a lot of different mistakes that new Zors make. If you are a Zor, you should listen to this. If you are a Z, you should listen to this from the perspective of, is this my Zor and how do I navigate this as a new franchisee with a franchisor that's probably going to make some of these mistakes. So I hope you enjoy this episode of Franchise Secrets. So when we first met, one of the things that I was talking to you about is like, I wanted to understand like, your goal with the company, what you're doing, because you didn't have any experience in food. Uh, you had you know, a lot of business experience. And they started telling me about the team that you had. And I was just like, wow, like Bennett's doing things the right way. I want to be involved with this. So give me some of your philosophy around hiring, building a team, who you got on your team, because I think it's just amazing. Yeah, so you mentioned the E-Myth model, and that's that's, what I live with, you know, so the solar company we built, uh, me and my brother built the solar company within a year, we were out of the business and we sold it six months after that. So 18 months later, and that was because day one of the business, what, where do we want to take this business? Okay. Let's create the org chart. What does that look? How many people do we have? And then you start working on each position. This is the, the roles of this position. Then you go hire that out with the goal of, let me work my way out of the, the business so I could work on it rather than inside of it. So, um, now on this one, I may, maybe took some shortcuts because I didn't perfect all the roles before hiring it because I didn't know how to do that. So instead I just went and hired, you know, professional people that have been there, done that. Um, because it's like, well, can we open up, can I open up, you know, a thousand dirty dough stores? Probably, probably not. Um, can I, if I find somebody that's already opened up, you know, several hundred stores, Pro probably right. There's not. Anyway, so, so the first person that we hired, the first big hire was uh, our CEO, Jill Summer Hayes. I actually contacted her to be an advisor and she's like, you need me full time. <laughs> <laughs> she invented the mobile franchise concept. This was back in the eighties. Um, she founded the company Maui Wowie Smoothies and Coffee, 
grew it to just under 700 locations and then sold it um, after running it for 35 years. So it's like, wow, you know, been there, done that. Well, then she started a franchise development company and her first client hired her as CEO. So she took that company from nothing to 90 locations in a few years. So I'm like, not only she's done it once, she's done it twice. So let's, uh, let's, let's get her on board to mitigate the errors that I'm bound to, <laughs> to, to make, you know, her experience. So let's lean on that. And then, well, the, the warehouse and, you know, I talked about now we're in the food business and we're in the food production business. Well, I've never done that. There's a company called American crafts and they do paper crafts. So one of my close friends, two and a half years ago, um, they contacted him. He's got a food science background. They said, Hey, we want to get into, um, food crafts. Uh, can you, can you develop this program? And he did. So fast forward two and a half years, he's built two warehouses for him, 130,000 square feet each hired everybody, sourced all the equipment. They did 70 million last year in just the food side from zero to 70 million in, in two and a half years. So I'm like, okay, well, if he could do it for them, he could probably do it for us. And the same thing with the, the guy that we hired for all of our logistics, you know, he had a trucking company that did 50 million last year. So let's get him on to do all of our logistics because we want to move fast. <laughs> so how, how do you move fast without, you know, let's avoid as many mistakes as we, as we can by leaning on the experience of people who have been there, done that. So tell me uh, more about the thought behind the board of advisors. Cause you, cause that's one of the things that I do. Why did you, obviously you reached out to Jill for board of advisors, like, sorry, you need me. And, and like, kudos to you for just listening to that. I mean, but like why board of advisors? Um, I didn't, anyway, so I, so I sold the solar company and I'm like, cool. I just started my first company and I sold it relatively quick you know, kind of on top of the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> then my buddy's like, Hey, there's this startup course in Utah. And I was in San Diego, like fly here, come to this three day event. Um, and I'm like, sure, I'll do it. Like, I probably know, you know, I know what a startup is. I didn't know anything. So I took this course and the guy who taught it was John Richards. He was the first person to take yellow pages online. And then they IPO would that company. Um, they took it public in, in 2000, I believe as Infospace. Um, and since then he's been an investor in like, you know, a hundred plus companies and like almost half of those have had successful ex exits. So it, I learned it from his course, like you need an advisory board. And I'm like, well, who better to have on your advisory board than the person teaching me about advisory boards. <laughs> so I talked, I talked to John kind of, you know, Hey, here's our model. And he said, well, I, I sit on the advisory board of two or three companies at a time. And yeah, I, I would be your guys' senior advisor. Um, so I'm like, sweet who else do we get? Right. And that's, you know, I'm calling Jill and then we got Steve Hart. He owns property management. Inc. It's the largest property management franchise in the nation. They have 400 franchises. Um, so started just trying to build up that advisory role. And again, if I don't know how to do it, I can take the time and money to learn it, or I can take a little shortcut here and there by hiring or giving equity to an Eric who knows what he's doing um, and who's leaps and bounds ahead of me. I do all the grunt work per se, you know, me, me and Wade. And then we just follow the people who know, you know, we take the advice from the people who know what they're doing. I love that. And if you're starting out from scratch, you don't have, here's the thing. I hear brands, they reach out to me, Eric, I want, I want you as an advisor, but they are afraid to give up very much of their company. And I don't need a lot of a company to help, but they don't understand the value, what an advisor brings. And until you understand, if you don't understand the advi what the advisor can really bring, which is speed, help you, like, help you move fast, avoid a bunch of costly mistakes and set you up to, uh, you know, to be a brand uh, that's a force to be reckoned with. But if you don't understand that value, you know, it, what advice would you give to somebody? Like, what, what, what was your other option if you weren't to hire advisors, if you weren't to hire Jill, like where would you be right now? And what would your trajectory be? I would have 100% of a small pie. <laughs> that's what I would have, right? So it's, you, you're giving up equity or, you know, even if it's an investor, whether it's 10%, 5%, 1%, 20%, doesn't matter. The question is, will this allow me, if this is we're talking 10%, is this investment or this person or whatever, is this going to allow me to grow faster than, you know, and have my company be bigger than 10% of what it could be? So if the answer is yes, then it's like, yeah, I'd much rather have a smaller piece of 
a larger pie, right? That I mean, my goal is much larger than just open franchises, and, and and maybe we'll get to that. But it's all centered on making an impact, being purpose driven towards mental health awareness, uh, specifically in kids. So how am I going to do that? Does it matter if I have a hundred percent of the company, or can I have ninety percent of the company, right? And uh, and bring on the right people so I can actually fulfill my purpose. Attention, franchisors! If you are not bringing in many of the right franchisees, sales are slow. It's stealing too much of your time as a founder trying to award franchises to the right franchisee. There's a better way to do it. That's why I started the Franchise Sales Mentor. If you want to have access to the information, the techniques, the ways that the best franchise sales organizations are awarding franchisees, then you might want to check out the Franchise Sales Mentor. The reasons that franchisors join is because they want access. They want access to my Rolodex. They want access to my connections. They want access to shortcut both short-term and long-term success to increase enterprise value to their brand. All right, let's switch gears to the Rob's product. Eric, why don't you take that, explain it, give the advantages, none of the disadvantages, only the advantages, save all those disadvantages for Shirley to come up with. Well, the advantages are, it's cool to use a program that the IRS literally made up a name where the acronym spells Rob's. I mean, who doesn't love that? <laughs> and by the way, they, they literally claim it had, they did not plan that. That was a pure happenstance. Uh, so Rob stands for rollovers as business startups. Hopefully most people that are listening are familiar at this stage that now for over 40 years, people have been able to access retirement funds that are no longer with the current employer, most likely, or not in any type of limiting type retirement plan, qualified funds that you can use without incurring any tax or penalty to fund a business. Um, advantages, I mean, my easiest one, I've always said, let's take all the other crazy things out of it. You're creating liquid. It's pre-tax liquid. So I always like to joke around with people. Do you want, hey, for your liquid, do you want to use pre-tax liquid or post-tax liquid? Uh, pre-tax. Okay, so we're going to leave your checking account untouched and we're going to use a rollover because you really are creating pre-tax liquid. You're putting retirement funds in investing into your own company. And through that investment structure, that corporation is creating the funds to operate the business. And those funds can be used for any legitimate business expense, working capital, franchise fees, salaries, salaries for your employees, salaries for yourself at different stages. Um, it can be used as the equity injection funds needed for SBA loans. It can be combined with other forms of lending. You're starting your business. If you were to just go the Rob's route, debt free. Um, the timeline to get funding, typically 15 to 20 business days, depending on where your funds are currently. Um, you can pay it back over time. There's no required payback. There's awesome exit strategies down the road to even minimize capital gains tax as your business grows. So um, I think when people get over the the paradigm shift that they usually have to go to go through when looking at retirement funds. If you really put the benefits of all the different lending programs on paper without the names of the programs and what asset they're using, my bet is a Rob's beats almost any other option every day of the week and twice on Sunday. But it's not perfect, which I'm sure Shirley's going to take over for me here. Um, and it's, it's something that goes against every emotional and logical thought we've pretty much been told since we took our first job in corporate. Um, you know, as I'm sure you've seen, Eric, most people buy businesses. And when they buy those businesses, what's the most common answer? I never would have bought, looked at this business on my own. I never would have thought I would have bought this business. I bet anyone that's ever used the Robs, every one of them said I would never use retirement funds to fund a, fund a business because they didn't know that it existed, how it works, what the nuances are. And when people realize if you've worked a lot of your time in corporate America and you've had a retirement plan and you've used any of your retirement funds to invest in the employers that you're working for and their stock, you've already done rollover funding. But instead of funding somebody else's business, you're funding your own. So um, that's my take. 
That was good. That was really good. All right, Shirley. Are there any disadvantages to the ROBS program? I mean, I don't know that there are true disadvantages. Wait a second. Wait, wait. I love how both of you are like this. When we get to the disadvantages, you're like, well, it's all advantages. It's not really disadvantage. No, I'm teasing you. Where I, why I'm saying that is because earlier you were mentioning something with the SBA, people talking about maybe having some special programs or whatnot. And you mentioned, Eric, like these lenders are marketers. Like there's a marketing side to a lending business and you create products, you create things that that help you get more business. So what we're doing here is hopefully dispelling some of those things that are myths, myths or marketing tactics that other people uh, may be using so we can have real clear uh, information here that you can take to the bank. So um, Shirley, keep going down the same vein that you are going down. Well, I mean, I think that there, one of the things Eric mentioned is there are some hurdles to get over in your mind. Like it is a psychological issue. And so I think probably one disadvantage is that it brings fear into a situation that's already pretty nerve wracking, right? Like nobody needs more fear, but I, I do think that that whole idea of, Hey, wait, this nest egg that I've been collecting for years, you know, am I really going to go throw it at this business? So, I mean, I definitely think that that is a hurdle right? For a lot of folks. Um, I think that if you are unfamiliar, if you are a brand new business owner, if you haven't had several conversations with your CPA about different business structures and what they could mean and the fact that they can all look relatively the same based on how your account was doing what they're doing, you know, I think that if you are not familiar with that, sometimes the structure of a C corporation can feel daunting. It can feel overwhelming. There's more paperwork to get it formed, right? And, and the C corporation structure is a requirement with the ROMS program. So I would say that that's an area where you lose choice. And I don't think anybody likes to lose choice either, right? So if there's a disadvantage, maybe that's it. You don't get to decide what your corporate structure is. That's decided for you. The structure itself does not have to put your business at a disadvantage, but it is a choice you don't get to make, right? And I think that that's another one where it can not feel good, right? That, that that's just sort of taken out of your hands. Do that. Keep going. So, well, I was just going to say, I think that again, for a lot of folks, when this is all brand new to add something else in brand new, that feels really radical is tough and, you know, can take a little bit more time. Um, but again, it doesn't mean that overall it puts your business at a disadvantage. You know, it's just maybe tougher to sort of get your arms around what this really looks like and what it means. I think one of the things too, like you mentioned it, it's a mindset shift. Um, and then especially it's a mindset shift. And then you have a CPA that's not, that doesn't like C corps for whatever reason, cause they have more complexity to them, but a lot of things with more complexity because they have really cool strategies. And so there's strategies with C corps that you can't do with other corps. And there are strategies that you can do with Rob's that you can't do with other things and with all the tax advantages. But if you have a CPA that's not familiar with that, or just doesn't like C corps or doesn't like that for whatever reason, cause they are not used to that type of client that can cause you to lose trust in the program. And, um, and I don't like that. So what do you, what do you suggest someone that really wants to get educated on that? And their CPA says, uh, Hey, Shirley, Hey, Eric, you know, the, the, my CPA who I trust says the Rob's program's stupid. I say, let's get on a call together. I like a three-way conversation. You know, let's, let's make sure that these are valid concerns and not just misunderstandings or misconceptions. I think that's the best way to do it. Just communicate through it. Right. And make sure that everybody has the best data. Perfect. Yeah, I um, I, I lived this literally at the end of last week. I had a client that had started the process of doing the robs with Benetrends, speaks to the CPA, calls me the next day and says, Eric, I want to unwind this. He says, I'll be better off being an LLC and going to get an SBA loan. I said, listen, I'm, let's do that. I'll unwind everything. There's nothing we do. We can't back off and refund. No problem. But I just want to make sure it's what's best for you and that you guys understand what the next steps would be. And we get on the call with the client and the accountant. And at the end of the call, the accountant was telling him to do the robs because, oh, wait a minute. It's not a fixed rate loan. Oh, wait, they're going to want this. Oh, wait, he's going to wait eight, nine, 10 plus weeks to close on this. And, oh, wait, that's right. If I do a C-Corp, he's going to take out most of the money in profit expenses, contributions, dividends. He's not going to pay corporate tax. Um, so there's really no problem with the C-Corp. Yeah, let's do that. And so, yeah, surely I just... 
get educated. And I listen, we all have our CPAs. We all love them. But just remember, they're people. And people would rather say no to something than admit they don't fully understand something. And I will tell you, if your CPA does your personal tax returns every year, chances are they're not a corporate or small business account. They usually have 80% of their clients that are that. That's great. Let them keep doing that. If you're a small business owner, franchisee, um, you want somebody that has other franchisees, other small business owners. Um, my favorite line from an accountant was, if you've paid double tax in a C-Corp, one of two things happened. Um, one, you made way too much money, or two, you need to fire your accountant. And, and that was from the accountant. So I was just saying, hey, listen, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so um, yeah, I would just say get educated. Explain that to somebody that doesn't know what possible double taxation looks like. I mean, in simplest terms, when when people say double tax, which by the way, and I'm going to surely, I'm, I'd love to hear your thoughts here. Most people, when they bring it up to us, know the phrase double tax. They don't know what it means. They're just like, oh, I don't want to pay double tax. And then I ask them, well, what does that mean? They're like, um, I don't know. And really what people look at is I'm going to pay tax on the money that I make. And then the corporation in a C corporation pays the corporate tax rate on certain funds that are remaining in the corporation on the profits or a certain area side. Um, so people view it as I'm paying taxes individually and on the corporate side. Um, but there's ways to minimize, if not eliminate, the need for the corporation to pay those taxes. And rather than getting into all those boring details, fortunately, we have a lot of people that do our job for us, uh, Shirley, is, you know, the president goes around the country every, every month. Hey, we've got all these big companies paying, not paying their share <laughs> in corporate taxes. Well, notice he never says they're breaking any laws. Why do you think these big companies, when you hear XYZ company buys back X amount of stock, or why do they pay big bonuses at the end of the year or do X, Y, and Z? Because they're taking the money that's sitting in the profit and putting it back into expenditures, acquisitions, contributions back to retirement plan, zeroing out or minimizing the amount of corporate profit that ends up paying the double tax portion. Shirley, anything to add to that? I think that a lot of people just assume I'm a W-2 employee because that's what I am in a C corporation. I'm paying taxes when I get a paycheck. My company's paying taxes. Everything was taxed twice. And it's just not that simple. I think, you know, so to, to Eric's point, it, it's just more about the difference between taxes you pay as an employee versus taxes the company pays based on its net profit and all the deductions and strategies that your accountants can help you employ along the way. And I think the other thing is too, I know Eric does, you know, we're networked with accountants across the country, right? So if your family guy who's been doing your personal taxes for the last 20 years isn't the right guy, that's okay. You know, we can help make those connections too, because there are a lot of people out there with no dog in the fight in terms of how you fund your business, right? But with the knowledge and the expertise to sort of just help with that guidance. So here's the deal with the Franchise Tribe Mastermind. It's full of a bunch of successful franchisees across many different industries, many different brands, and you get to be a part of that. Now, if you've had any level of success in franchising, you've probably been around top performing Z's in your current brand. So think about that. And if you could do that with 40 plus different brands, industries, franchisees, that's the value in the mastermind. I bring in some of the best speakers in the world. We talk about some topics that will never be talked about anywhere else. So if you're interested in being a part of a group like that, check out FranchiseTribe.com. Last week's episode or a couple weeks ago, we talked about the buying process from the franchisor's perspective. Today, I'm gonna to go through the buying process, but I'm going to be doing it from the buyer's perspective. So buyers, you're gonna to wanna to listen to this. Franchisors that have a, a development process, you're bringing on new franchisees, and whether you're confident or not confident in that process, you're gonna to wanna to listen to this because you want to know what buyers go through when they're going through your process. I'm gonna be talking about some of the things that franchisors do right 
and they do wrong and that buyers do right and that buyers do wrong. And I've worked with tens of thousands of buyers or supposedly buyers over the years and I've been a buyer. So let's jump into it. Before I jump into the process, I want to talk about the franchise development team because as a buyer, you're going to be working with different types of people and you're going to have different types of experiences with them. So I want to uh, dive into that first. Um, and it's going to tell you if the franchisor is selling, then um, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I know franchise founders that are selling, that are going through the franchise, taking people through the franchise buying process, and they have full on CEO founder duties, but they love working with new franchisees and they might have somebody else doing it or a team doing it, but they're very active in it themselves. And I can see why they would want to do that. So don't read into that, whether it's good or bad, it's just is what it is. But when you do have the founder selling, I, you get, you get access to them and you get access to uh, really understanding who they are, what drives them, things like that. So if a franchisor is selling, most likely it's an emerging brand and they don't have a lot of franchisees yet or they just absolutely love the franchise development process. If they're a new uh, franchisor, then just really uh, know that they probably really are wanting you as a franchisee. Like they really want you as a franchisee because they need franchisees. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, that's how franchisors grow. So if you really like that brand, you're probably going to be able to do some really good negotiating and get a bigger territory or something a little bit more because you're dealing with the founder. And I'll say this, founders typically are more generous uh, than franchise development reps or than a franchise sales organization because you as a founder of your local business, you, you put yourself as a, as a franchisee. Whenever I was a franchisee, and I had customers come in, I was always giving them discounts because it's easy to do. And my employees, the team members would say, Eric, get out of here, go do something else. Just don't be in the business because you're giving too many discounts away. So if you're dealing with the founder, you might, you might get more than you would out of the deal than if you're dealing with somebody else. All right, that's the founder. Then you have franchise development reps. If they're new, you might be getting accurate information, your information that you're, uh, it might not be very accurate um, because they're just new to it. So just ask them, how long have you been selling franchises? Did you sell for anybody else? And if you're dealing with an experienced franchise development rep, they're probably gonna be more systematic on the approach that they take you through. And just know that they're probably not gonna let you run development and run the way that it's, it's supposed to go. They're gonna tell you. You're gonna say, I want to see the numbers. I want to talk to franchisees. I want to do this. And if they're experienced, they're going to say, heck no, snap back in line. We've got a process. You need to follow a process because if you don't follow a process, you're going to be the worst franchisee in the world. And we don't want the worst franchisees in the world. Now I'm being overly dramatic, but an experienced development rep keeps people in line because they got a process to follow and inexperienced, a new one, it's going to let you run all over them. So if you want to talk to franchisees on your first call and you push it, they're probably going to let you do that. Now it may or may not be the best thing. Sometimes that's not the best thing. You need to get information at, at a time when the franchisor should be giving it to you. Cause think about it this way. If you're talking to franchisees too early, you're going to be asking them stupid questions. And then when you have better questions, because you understand the model more and you can ask them better questions, they're really not going to want to talk to you because you've already asked them a bunch of stupid questions. So, uh, anyway, I've been pretty, pretty harsh on that, but I've seen it time and time again. So my advice is just to follow their process, whether they're new or their experience, just follow the process. And sometimes you have a fractional, uh, franchise development rep or part-time. And those are great because they're probably really experienced at what they do. They've done it for a number of different brands. I'll tell you this, it's hard to have a number of different brands going on in your head to keep track of different sales processes, different ways. But if they're experienced, then you've got somebody that knows franchising. And if they know franchising, then just ask them franchising questions in addition to brand questions, because you can learn a lot from an experienced franchise development person based on their experience in franchising. All right, next up, 
franchise sales organizations. Now, this may be an emerging brand that has an FSO, or it may be an, uh, an established brand as an FSO. An FSO is a franchise sales organization. If you want more information on franchise sales organizations, I did a podcast not too long ago with my friend Ryan Zink. He's the founder um, of Franchise Fastlane, which is one of the premier uh, franchise sales organizations out there. They are they you outsource your franchise development to them. They're not cheap. They are good. If you're a franchise uh, buyer working with a franchise sales organization, just do what they the just follow the process that they're taking you through because they've done it time and time again. So you just behave differently or you can behave differently. A franchise sales organization is going to tell you um, the whole process from the first call because that's what the best franchise development processes do. They tell you everything from that first call. They outline everything, a six to eight week sales process. These are the four to six things that you should that you should um, have to qualify for the brand, whether it's net worth, whether it's liquid capital, timing, time involved in the business, so many different things, but they're gonna be very crystal clear. So with a franchise sales organization, you better believe that you're going to know if that's a brand you want to continue to look at after the first call or two. And if it's and then after that third call, you're gonna know if you wanna to go to Discover Day or not because they're very, very good at taking you through a process. Now, they're also good at selling. So um, here's something else. Let's just get straight into, um, straight into, well, I talked about stacking the deck for the franchise, uh, for the franchise ors before. Let's talk about stacking the deck. As a buyer, what should you do to stack the deck? I think, you know, and this is assuming that you want the brand to want you. You want the brand to think that you're going to be a good franchisee. And as a buyer, I would think that's how you would want to behave. At least that's how you would want to present yourself. So you know that they're, that a franchisor has a system that they, that they follow uh, and they want you to follow going through the sales process, definitely being a franchisee. The easiest thing for a franchisor to know if you're a system follower, if you're going to execute the things that they want you to execute on is just doing it, Every, everything throughout the process. So if they have homework for you, just do the homework. If they have things for you to understand or do throughout the process, just do it. If they say you're getting ahead of yourself, then just say, okay, how do I not get ahead of myself? What should I do? How should I be thinking? So you just become a system and process follower at the same time, knowing like, is that a process or a system that you want to follow with that particular brand? So that's one way to stack the deck is just conform to their process. Because if you don't conform, they're going to be thinking this person is going to be a pain in my butt as they become a franchisee. And then just want just go into things asking questions, ask really good questions. Um, don't be afraid of asking bad questions because um, just ask questions that are really on your mind. If you have questions and they know that you're engaged, so um, whether it's questions about the franchise or the process, the system, their franchisees, how they do things, why they do the things that they do, if you go into it asking a lot of questions, you're stacking the deck in your favor. Um, don't be argumentative on stuff. I would, I get people that are just so argumentative versus understanding. So if you go into things seeking to understand versus be understood, you're stacking the deck in your favor. Think about it this way. Would you want to be your partner? Would you want to be a partner with yourself? If you wouldn't even want to be your own partner, then why would they want to be a partner with you? And they should be acting the same way. They should be helping you out. So ask for help. If you need to understand different things, then, then ask them for help with that stuff because they should want to be helpful. So those are a couple of things that you should do to stack the deck in your favor as you, as a buyer, go through the franchise development process. All right. And by the way, I have a free 100 validation questions to ask. Go to franchisesecrets.com forward slash validation. Check that out. Uh, there's a hundred questions and it's all free. So the questions that you can ask the franchise uh, franchisees as you uh, talk to them. All right, here's a franchise development process. The franchisor has this process. 
call center sets up that intro call. You have an intro call. You have an ops and marketing call or a unit economics call. You have team validation. You have franchisee validation. You're confirming for a discovery day. You're preparing for that discovery day, confirmation day. You're attending that confirmation day and you are closing or you are saying no. And that's the goal. The goal is when you have that first call with the franchisor is six to eight weeks later, you are saying yes, or you are saying no. Now, let me do you a favor and let me, and I'm going to, uh, the franchisors out there are going to love this. If you're not ready to buy in six to eight weeks, then just wait, just do a bunch of online research, read books, do all kinds, listen to this podcast. Don't start talking to franchisors. They have a process. Their process isn't let me educate you for two years. Maybe your territory will sell or it won't sell in that two years, but we'll spend a whole lot of time together and you're just going to kick tires even though you think you won't. If you're ready to buy in the next six to eight weeks, then engage with the franchise or and start conversations with them. If you're not ready to buy, then just continue to research because they have a process that they take you through. And at the end of that process is a time to say yes or no. And if you think you're ready to buy and you get to the end of that process and you just say no, not for any good, like really good reasons, you'll give yourself all kinds of good reasons. But if it's not a really good reason, here's probably what's happening. You are probably not meant to be an entrepreneur and that's okay. Because, and you are not a decision maker and that's okay. You probably should continue to work for somebody else until you get to that point because it's scary having a business. It is, it's scary not being able to meet payroll or getting close to payroll or dipping into savings or taking more money out of your 401k because there are unexpected expenses. So if all those things are on your mind at the very end, you're just not ready to be an entrepreneur and that's okay. It doesn't mean you're never going to be an entrepreneur. You're just not ready right now. So, um, but just be truthful and honest with yourself that you're not ready to make a decision. Cause I'll tell you this, the decision to buy a franchise is easier than a lot of the, the decisions that you're going to have to make as a franchisee, as an entrepreneur, they don't get easier. It's who do I hire? Where do I sign a lease? Do I buy this? Do I expand here? Where, what do I buy more of? What do I buy less of? How do I spend money on marketing? I can't spend money on marketing. I don't have enough income coming in. Oh, I need to spend more money on marketing to have more revenue coming in. I'm telling you, six to eight week process, make a, a, a decision, yes or no. If you can make a decision, then you're in a really good spot, even if that decision is no. Growing a brand, I think it has evolved. And, and it will continue to evolve. Um, and it's, it's, it's really hard, um, especially like, you know, in this current environment, if you think about it, if, if you are a, if you're a business that has a cost of goods, right? Um, chances are that the cost of goods have, that, that price has increased, right? Inflation, supply chain, like, so that puts a squeeze on margins and only so much of that can be pushed back to the customer. If you're a business that do you, you know, has labor, I mean, what business doesn't have labor? <clears throat> it's harder to find labor today than it was a couple of years ago, right? Labor is more expensive today than it was a couple of years ago. So, you know, those are things inside the business. But then when you're thinking about, you know, truly trying to grow this thing, I think Lane said it good, but it's like, you know, now people have to have access to capital. I think that capital in the next year or so or more is, I think that access to capital is going to be tougher than it has been in the past. And it's certainly going to be more expensive. I mean, if you haven't, unless you've been living under a rock, you know, everybody knows interest rates are going up, right? So whether, whether you're borrowing from a bank on a line of credit that went up, if you're getting an SBA loan and it's attached to a Fed fund rate, that went up or LIBOR, that one. I mean, the cost of capital is more expensive. Um, people that are investing are going to be more discerning. I mean, here's just a little side story. Um, there, there's a business out on the market today um, that is valued around 700-ish, you know, 700 million bucks. Um, 
word was that um, there was a, a very large private equity company that was going to make an investment and everybody kind of thought it was, it was a done deal and uh, the deal fell through and now it's back on the market and say, okay, well, it's good business. I mean, they seem to be a good match. The reason that it fell through was this huge private equity company um, decided that they were no longer going to do any more consumer deals for the rest of the year. So it didn't even have anything to do with this business. The fact that their fund had said, hey, we don't know what's happening with inflation. We don't know if a recession is coming and that's going to put pressure on consumer oriented businesses. So even though we love this business, like we're, we're going to walk away from the deal because we're not doing any more consumer deals. Once again, it had nothing to do with this business. That, that this is a fundamental change based on recession, interest rates, all that jazz. So that's just a, you know, that's just a little anecdotal story here of like the, the world is changing. So what can an emerging brand do now to kind of get prepared for that? Right. Number one is, is if you want to grow a business, you can't, you can't decide that the way you're going to, you know, that you're going to grow your business is with cash from franchise fees. I mean, it's unpredictable. Number one, number two, like, you know, some of that money is going to go away to whether, you know, the lead source that it came from or, or whatever, but obviously like cash flow needs to go back into the business so you can help to start building a support system for the franchisees. Um, so like you have to start thinking about, you know, how can I get access to capital? Um, and, you know, with, with ideally in a vacuum, in a perfect world, you would find, you would want to have access to capital from somebody or something that's going to add value back to the business, right? Just calling up your rich uncle and saying, can I borrow a hundred grand to throw on my balance sheet? If, if that guy can't add any more value behind the dollars, you're not really getting any more than the dollars. So like, that's, you know, that's kind of a big thing that, you know, we think that with everything that's changing, like, I think that cost of capital is going to go up. I think that the barriers to capital are going to become more difficult. And at the end of the day, every business needs capital to grow. You got to have access to capital. And if you could, on your best day, choose where that capital was going to come from, um, you'd want it with good terms, but you'd want it from a source that's going to add value back to the business, in addition to just the, you know, the, the dollars that it, that it represents. And so, you know, if you don't know where to get capital, then that's okay. But now is also the time to start putting together a group of advisors that can help you with this business, um, whether that's a board of advisors, whether it's even maybe a mentor. But you want to try to put together a group of advisors that can help you in various parts of your business. If you have something that has cost of goods, well, Find a somebody, whether you know them or you know somebody that knows these people, somebody that has something to do with supply chain. If it's if you got to know your numbers, like find a, an advisor that knows something about finance that might be able to introduce you to people with capital. So shoring up capital in case you need it, want it, or you're going to have to have it if you want to grow, putting together your group right? Whether it's super organized or it's more loose, um, an advisor, mentor that are strategic to various parts of your business, like that's like step one. Mm -hmm. Like you can't just wake up down the road when you got a bunch of franchisees and everybody's pissed, try to put that together at that point. Try raising capital then. Try getting advisors that want to come in and clean up your mess then. So like step one is get the right Get surround yourself with great people and whether it's a formal type thing or you go to a conference like springboard and just find people, meet people that can just provide you some advice and, and, and have an interest in you and your business, I think is incredible. But then once again, kind of like 
trying to, to you right now, you need to be, you need to be working on having access to capital and you want it to be from somebody I believe that can add value back to the business. So if you can get capital from a strategic advisor, even if you're an emerging brand, like in my mind, like in a vacuum, that's the, that's the perfect, that's the perfect one, two punch. So that's, that's my final statement for today. All right, Lane, um, on advisors, you know, Jeff and I over at Front Street Equity, we are doing strategic advisory in the trenches advisory to brands. Um, what would you say to a brand that was wanting to work with, well, whether it's Front Street, Eric and Jeff, or just bringing on advisors in general? Like, what would you, what would your comments be to that emerging brand, that founder? Okay, so I think that that's, they're on the right track, right? Because we talked about trying to build a bench. I just think, you know, not every deal is the same and every deal, you have to look at what you're, what you're getting in terms of skill set that you don't have and what it costs you. I would say that people sometimes think that giving away equity is there, is free. But I'm just going to give that away and in exchange for some promise that isn't even written down, where you're giving all the equity up front and then there's no performance criteria or I just see people don't put a huge value on it when it is by far the most valuable thing that you have to trade with. And, and to Jeff's point, when you become royalty self-sufficient and you have a real valuation, you know, all those shares are going to really matter. And it's very difficult to get them back, mm-hmm. enough, buying them back from folks who did it. And it's very difficult to get them back from people even who perform marginally on their promises. So it's really important to have well-documented deals that talk about what people are actually contributing and how often you'll meet and what kind of access you'll have to them in their network and, and those kind of things. And then I think most importantly, talk to other folks that they've done deals with, right? Because everybody's got a good glossy brochure to say how amazing they are. Everybody's grandmother loves her. Everybody's dog jumps into their lap, but it doesn't mean it's a great fit for you. And so really talking to other people and understanding how this, these folks did it, like anybody in this business knows they'll be evaluated on their next deal by how they played their, their last game. And so, you know, founders are usually pretty candid about what happened. You know, it's, you know, sometimes you want to keep control and you want to run everything yourself and take a minority investment. Sometimes you want to sell the whole thing and become an employee of the, like those are qualitatively extremely different opportunities. And talking to folks that have been in, you know, already done that with folks that have a track record and it is the way to make sure that you are well-informed as you go in. And, you know, sometimes you, try to build in some escape hatches that if it doesn't go quite exactly as planned, that I mean, I know I'm a, I'm a lawyer, but I think about the exit at the same moment I'm thinking about getting in to the deal because everybody talks about getting into the deal, but nobody thinks about unscrambling it. And, and there are circumstances where somebody representing a franchisor could unwind it if it, it doesn't happen the way it's supposed to contractually. So, you know, some people do it all, you know, they take the money first and then they're going to memorialize it later. Like nobody's, negotiable at that moment when the money's spent, right? It has to be all done up front and it has to be done with somebody who's skilled and has done a lot of these deals. So you know what market is on these things. Like Jeff said, everything changed. Inflation, interest rates, the market went down dramatically. The people's, you know, portfolios are down in terms of what they can borrow against and go do. A lot of it, just like it was the last time we had an economic downturn where people are already bought and committed, but no longer bankable, right? I mean, there's lots of things happening. And the good thing about an event like Springboard is everybody's, de- nobody anticipated those headwinds or maybe you were really smart people did, but everybody's dealing with the same ones and everybody's trying to develop technology, disruptive technology solutions that deal with the staffing issues or, you know, and it, everyone thinks technology is going to be the thing that saves the day. It has been in the past, but, you know, people, you know, those, that technology exists. And I think you want to make sure that you're aware of it and that you know what other people are doing or using and implementing. And I think that an event like Springboard or others like it, give you a, an opportunity in real time to network with folks about people in your exact situation that have are dealing with the same exact headwinds that are trying to get people sold, trying to get people awarded, trying to get people open, trying to get find real estate. And I think there's a lot of sharing in the community. We always laugh about the franchise family and who invented that nomenclature, but the you have a franchise family, whether you know it or not, emerging franchisors. And there's a lot of folks that will help you or give you a rung or a hand or a helping hand um, or just share a, an advice or contact with you that um, that you have to come out of your comfort zone or your shell to ask for. I was like, even at Springboard, I think when we were doing the sit up, sit down thing, they try to identify the folks that were new. It was at least 50%. That means well, at least 50% of the people don't know are emerging and don't know anything. Right. So it's like, and you saw those people like, like 
piled up in every corner and at, at all of our networking events because they're all trying to get a minute with Jeff. And once Jeff did his performance and everybody wanted a piece of him, but I think you listen to people talk and then you try to pull them aside and pull their, you know, their constituents aside to try to understand more about what they're doing and how they're doing it. I think it's almost impossible to do this all yourself based on your own conception of what you think right and wrong is. Jeff, you have a lot of experience, but I, I've never heard you say that, you know, you conducted any part of this, of your franchise journey without making mistakes along the way. In fact, it was oh, for sure. You know, like Fred Flintstone with the bumps. And, I mean, just even people who know what they're doing. So the yep. point is you have to get yourself out and circulate and you have to not sit in your room and not resist the thumb typing and the dealing with the present emergency that will certainly be waiting for you. But when you go to these events, you got to be, be, you know, fully engaged with meeting the folks around you and getting the context for what you're otherwise dealing with. Cause everybody else is dealing with the same thing, but you don't know that, right. It's sitting there in your office, talking to the people that, you know, to your best friend from college. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to whatever channel you're listening on. If you want my help with anything from buying a franchise to franchising your business, please visit FranchiseSecrets.com.